uh, in Indonesia, we we quite not so concerned about the sustainable okay. business. So I learn very much. Yeah. Business. I actually have a one friend. Uh, he's from Indonesia. And he has um, something like social projects. Uh, yeah, and it's also related to sustainability. One. It was something about to help people from uh, who is free from the jail to integrate back to the community. Oh, that's nice. Um, yeah. In which part of Indonesia he, he lives? I might be wrong in pronunciation, but it's called something Mamuju or something. Oh, Mamuju. Like Mamuju. I, I heard that. Mamuju is in the uh, eastern side of Indonesia, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where where do you locate in Indonesia? Actually, I'm um, on the Java Island and the main island of Indonesia, where the mm -hmm. capital of Jakarta. Uh, but um on the eastern side of the capital so i'm i live okay. in yogyakarta mm. that's interesting yeah and how about you roman yeah uh i'm located in moscow so i just came back from uh, my hiking trip oh. uh, yeah we'll t talk about Hi. it uh, later yeah so now i'm in, at moscow uh it it took like two weeks uh, for me to get rid of the civilization. Now I'm pretty happy to come back to it because in the, I, I was in mountains actually, and it's like the drill uh, and wild nature on the mountains. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cold actually. Now it's bad. I like, I like hiking on mountains so. Yeah. Okay, do, do you have a university right now, like classes, uh, lectures, or you will start yeah. soon? Do, do you have university schedule right now, or you will start yeah, soon? Yeah, actually, actually uh, last 10 minutes I have a class in mm. Indonesia. Yeah. So maybe some of my friends still on the class, I think. And I'm the <laughs> only one who joining early. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> so am I am I get it right that uh, the other participants are your classmates, or yeah. just well, from the same university and not really? Uh, mostly of the participant is my classmate, but we I think we we got one one participant that coming from India that living in Germany. Mm. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. So waiting for the guys. Hey, William. Hello. Okay, we're growing. It's almost three participants.
How are you doing, guys? How was the day? I assume the day was pretty tight and difficult since everybody is on mute. <laughs> How many students do we still need to wait? I think about five. It's like it's only half of us. Okay, let's wait for maybe two, three minutes more and then we'll start. Tell me, how was your day, guys? I, I heard that you had the classes before this one. Mm, so yeah. are you ready for another yeah. one? Yeah, yeah we have another class. Uh, Okay, that's great. W what did you study? Is it something uh, somehow related to sustainability topics or business topics? Uh, it's a marketing topic. Marketing one. Okay, that's interesting. Do, do you have any specification inside the marketing or you learn the general marketing, maybe digital marketing? Oh, it was a, a seminar, actually. 
the in Indonesia there's like a, a seminar in the last stages of uh, college, mm -hmm. the university. Yes, mm, that's interesting. Yeah, marketing is a really hot topic right now, especially because of the social media and other things. You have to promote your goods and services. <clears throat> Okay, I think we can slightly start. Okay. Do you, so do you guys see the screen right now? Is it um, everything good with the yeah, picture? I can, I can see it. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we can slightly start. Uh, I hope um, you will enjoy this lecture as um, you enjoyed the previous two lectures too. Uh, today we're going to talk um, about the climate change and sustainability incentives. So actually, uh, basically we would like to look at the current snapshot of the situation in the world. <clears throat> what do, are we doing toward the sustainability? What we are not doing? What are the constraints? We'll cover all these topics. Uh, my name is Roman Kozlov. Uh, just a bit of information about me. I finished Moscow State University in chemistry and physical engineering and worked also as an analyst in sustainability sphere uh, and a researcher at Institute of Problem of uh, Chemical Physics. Uh, also, I am uh, alumni of Civic Leadership Summit and do some social ventures in, in my university. Um, I hope you enjoyed the previous two lectures uh, and just a brief reminder to you, uh, feel free to stop me to ask questions, to clarify some maybe ter terminology, maybe some concepts that you're not familiar with, uh, because the goal of the lecture is to, is to uh, make you understand what, what is going on right now in sustainability sphere. Uh, just let's do a quick warm up. Uh, what I uh, write down in the chat your expectation about the lecture, what you would like to do uh, to understand to to know. Let's spend a couple of minutes on this would be very interesting to hear from you. Any expectations, or you can just unmute you and tell. And by the way, could somebody tell what was the most insightful moment from the previous lecture, maybe uh, the first one lecture? What did you like the most? Okay, I will write down. Uh, I mean, I can't really say the most. I think it's the way uh, the lecturer or the professor is so, how do I say it? Uh, she like, uh, she's, she's like, she, she talks to us, you know, rather than lecturing, she is more like she's talking to us, like, you get it? You get my point? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting one. Okay, so, no expectations in the chat. I write uh, my own that I expect a lot of fun and uh, engagement from you. So yeah, guys, um, let's start. Today we're gonna to cover three uh, big blocks of our lecture. The first one is more like conceptual one, why we need to align our actions. The second one we will uh, drill down and uh, concentrate on, on different in incentives that are existing in the world. 
<clears throat> that pushes us towards sustainability or uh, out of it. And then we will uh, discuss and uh, speak with you about the next steps and opportunities for us. And uh, let's start from the very first one. The, the first topic um, is, uh, the thing is that uh, there are actually uh, main three forces that pushes us towards sustainability or um, out of the sphere. Uh, this is the business, government and society. You can see the description, the brief description of everybody. And I will speak from the position of business uh, precisely because this is sustainable business strategy school. And uh, okay. And we would like to, to look from the prism of the business. So the business originally is goal to make profit uh, while selling the goods uh, within different operations and services and the additional product value where it is created. And uh, the product is uh, to narrow the gap between the necessity of the society, of industries and uh, the business producers. So business is a major driver, a major driving force in sustainability, uh, since it possesses a lot of assets influencing both environmental, economical and social part of all over the world. For example, metallurgical plant, it utilizes extensively uh, natural resources, um, fossil fuels to produce energy. It also contributes to the global economy, selling construction materials. And uh, it also influences society because um, it's, it's like a common practice that the metallurgical plants uh, build next to the small cities and all the city work for this plant. So the huge uh, social impact from this plant to the society. Then we have another part, which is society and businesses closely related to it since it impacts a lot and serving for the society, for society needs. And society form new trends, in, uh, evolve, evolve and um, develop variety of non-commercial assets such as cultures, norms, uh, trends maybe. So for example, today we are living in a society that are pretty digital one. And it means that the classical industries like heavy industries um, probably take, uh, take down their positions. So the, the commercial sphere, media sphere is becoming more preferable for us. And the government actually, uh, it covers and interacts with both business and society and serving a lot for it. Um, so it's framing the development of business and society and the government actually um, is the biggest, play the biggest role to towards sustainability because uh, business do all the work and society do all the work inside of the government, as you can see on the scheme. So the government uh, probably frame the direction of development of the world, of the business. Your, your business can actually play outside of the government but it will not be fair and not sustainable in the long term. So this is the first block, how does um, schematically it does look like? And then, okay, so I had a question. I understood uh, the role of government, society and business. But then what should every uh, player do? And here's uh, two components of success. We need unity of actions and well aligned actions and cooperation. Uh, since I'm a chemical engineer uh, on my back, on background and I had a class on physics, I will uh, demonstrate it on the several examples. The first one is unity of actions. Uh, if, you, if you see the string here uh, is pretty strong, but it's strong. It's not just uh, the strong of one stripe plus another one plus another one. It's more complex and it's, um, it's multiple uh, multiples. Uh, uh, the strength of each uh, single stripe multiples and it becomes uh, even more stronger than each of them separately. The second aspect is uh, from Russian fairy tale about the land actions. You can see on the picture that the three entities tell, okay, we will do our work as we can see this and their force vector summer in sum uh, gives us equal uh, zero. So no movement at all, but every, every part moved over their own uh, direction. And uh, th this is why we need well-aligned actions and cooperation. 
So, uh, however, there are some constraints that should be overcome toward the goal. If you, we would like to make more sustainable world or anything in the world, we need to overcome four barriers. The first one is transparency of actions. Everybody should not hide something behind his back and uh, cooperation should be crystal clear and not ambiguous. Second one is responsibility. Uh, the planetary health should not become the global uh, destiny in good case and should not become the nobody uh, responsibility in the worst case. So every part should take on responsibility and uh, work toward this. Uh, so the next one is mindset. Mindset uh, changers is needed to better uh, provide the urgency and necessity of need. Imagine Greta Thun Thunberg. Well, it's pretty like the media phenomenon, but she became as a prophet of changes. So she advocated for global society toward being more sustainable, be more eco-friendly. Uh, so we need uh, more people who communicate this uh, urgency of need and necessity of need. And the first factor of success and barrier also is proactive and engaging leadership. Proactive collaboration and strong structuring management activities with bold actions is uh, highly required because uh, what we see today, uh, just a, a brief uh, description, uh, today a lot of business leaders talk about that we need to do X, Y, Z, but they're doing nothing. So it's only just talks, not actions but we need to uh, more concentrate on actions. Okay, so guys, this was the, this was the pretty uh, philosophical introductory part. And today um, we're gonna focus more precisely on snapshot of current situation, uh, what is going on in the world in sustainability, and we will actually cover four types of incentives. Okay, let's start. Um, do you guys familiar with uh, sustainable development goals? Just no, right I, not really. Yeah, okay. Not really. Okay. So, yeah, um, there is a thing that United Nations um, like create in 2015. The United Nations created 17 sustainable development goals. They are structured around the different ways. Uh, it the goals is devoted to. Like this is the goal for the global society, for the world that we're gonna to become uh, on a horizon of 10 years, 15 years and et cetera. And they advocate that uh, there are 17 goals. Uh, for example, one of 13th goal is climate action. Another one is stop uh, zero hunger. Another one is alternative energy and et cetera. So uh, during the school, so there are 17 goals and uh, they are like very, like also philosophical one, they are not uh, really like, it's not necessary to follow them for every business organization. It's like the directional um, directional vision of where we should come. And during the school, uh, I would like to focus more on uh, climate action goal, which is closely related to our school. So this is the 13th uh, goal, and this is how it's structured. Actually, when you set the goal, you would like how somehow to track your progress your progress toward the goal, right? Uh, for example, if I would like to, let's say, finish the university, I have to have some checkpoints, the first grade, the second grade, the third grade, etc. And this is how the goal is structured. It actually has five components, um, strength and resilience, and adaptive capacity to climate related to disaster. This means that we need to become more stress resilient to any climate disaster. For example, flood. We need to be ready for this, or people uh, should not die from the flood. The second one is integrate climate change measures into policy and planning. Uh, this means that uh, the communication of the uh, governments should then go down and transform into some laws, regulations, and other things. The third one is build knowledge and capacity to meet, meet climate change. And this is closely related to our school. Uh, it basically means that we need to educate people on how to be sustainable, how to meet climate changes, and how to work with it. The fourth one is um, implement the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And uh, it's all about the financing the activities, as you can see on the right side. 
And the last one is promote mechanism to raise capacity for planning and management. Uh, it means that we need to help uh, promote the sustainability incentives in developing countries, um, maybe in Africa, maybe in other things. Uh, yeah, so this is how the goal is structured. And as you can see, uh, why I'm telling this is a directional one, because some of them might be uh, measured. For example, the first one, we can measure death and injuries from natural disasters, like uh, in on a, some time, time scale, but we cannot me measure education on climate change. <laughs> Do you have any ideas how to measure education on climate change? In what units, what is the mythology might be? Probably not. There, there is a pretty ubiquitous uh, goal. So this is why I'm telling this is directional one. And um, it's also very crucial for all the stakes, society, business, and public institutions, uh, since it threatens us with a lot of consequences. If we will fail this goal, we will face physical risks, for example, um, just as a part. The hot atmosphere will give us more fires, more ice melting, more enormous environment for people living, especially with a heart problem, because it's, it will be very hot for them to live and very difficult. Um, and this is very huge, the systematic problem that need to be solved. Just for example, uh, as an example of this, um, how, how can we track this goal? There is a website, a world in data, and you can also um, Google uh, the United Nations SDGs, how they track the records. And as one factor, you can see internally displaced persons from natural disasters. Why is this, uh, why this problem is uh, so crucial? Because of geopolitical instability. Imagine that the people, uh, let me annotate, Imagine the people, you know probably that this is the equator of uh, Earth, and this is the most hot, um, hot area in the world. Imagine that it becoming more hotter and the, the more regions here becoming more hotter as well. So the people will outflow from this to toward uh, more northern parts because uh, the weather will be more affordable for them. And uh, this phenomenon called uh, climate migration, uh, what does it mean uh, essentially? Is that people from the middle, from the equator regions will move toward the Europe, uh, driven by conflicts, uh, by heat and other things. And it will influence toward the global instability because probably the people in Nordic countries would like, would not appreciate so much, uh, so big inflow of uh, migration into their country because, because the cultural borders will be shuffling and other things will happen. So this is just like an example of what might become. Okay, and um, how can I just give me a second to remove this uh, annotation? Did you see actually the annotation? Uh, yes, I can see. Okay, do, do you guys uh, have some questions so far? Mm, no, I don't. Okay, let's move forward. Um, what is going on today? Imagine that we are somewhere in this tipping point and we have a, a lot of options. Um, the worst option for us, the, the option of um, global atmosphere heating. So the first option, if we will not do anything. So we say, okay, this is just fake problem. We'll work as we worked. This is business as usual scenario. No climate policies implemented, no technologies implemented. And we will uh, heat up to five degrees increase in temperature average in the world. But this is a problem of average. If we're talking about the average, it means that in some region, it will be heating up to 10 degrees. In some, it will be heating up to two degrees. The insanely big difference. So if some, uh, for example, this summer was very hot in Moscow, plus 33 degrees Celsius, and it was extremely hot in, in the city. If you don't have the conditioner, you, it, will, it was very difficult to live. 
and we will we might face more and more such uh, severe disasters in future and this is really bad because it's disrupt ec economy people life and other things what else what are what are what are the other options that we can do uh we have the current policies that will try to bring us more uh, less than three degrees but it's um even more right now because we are this is the data for 2020 or 2019 uh and we also have the ambition to two degrees 1.5 degrees and i would tell that 1.5 degrees is completely unachievable right now because um it was a research when it was suggested that today we are already we have already experienced a temperature increase average in the world by 1.1 degrees so we have only 0.4 degrees to meet this goal and it's completely unachievable uh another thing another interesting thing is that if we will for example let me annotate again another example is that we'll say okay there is no climate policies we don't need this and we will move on this trajectory okay and then suddenly at this point we realize that it's pretty hot in the uh, in the world and uh we faced a lot of physical risks floods volcanoes fires and we say okay we need to decrease the temperature we need to go something here or there you see this huge uh, like increase in firstly increase and then abruptly going down it will it will cost a lot of toward the global economy uh, a lot of in money in uh, people's life because we will uh, make a mistake here so this is why uh, a lot of business leaders, politi politicians dis discuss now which one, which attempt we should uh, go for. Uh, do you have any questions on this slide? Maybe uh, some question about the policies, um, trajectories? No question. Okay. Thinking taste quota, but then um, we can move forward with you uh, toward our policies and scenarios. Okay, so basically we can we we looked uh, at the um, retrospective what is going on right now. Now we understand that firstly we need to do some policies toward um, toward this one point five degree uh, pathway or two degree pathway um okay so how can we do this now we're going to discuss the measures how how can we achieve the, those things and actually there are four types of incentives this is the tree that i will would suggest you uh this is not exhaustive there might be uh, some other things that not come to here but i uh bring all the brightest initiatives that demonstrate to you how what is the world ambition towards sustainability okay so there are four of them uh financial um uh, which means that we imply some financial implications toward businesses companies some fares taxes and other things uh since we're living in the capitalism and money you can buy completely everything for money uh and this is money is the blood um uh, of our organization you understand if you if you mean the organization is a mechanism and uh, money its blood the financial Im impact on on its blood then you have the regulatory this is uh it comes uh usually from the government uh, how they regulate and frame business development business direction and other things then you have informational one because um probably you remember from your marketing classes that it's very it's very uh, crucial to communicate what is your company doing uh why your product is good uh, it works also for sustainability sphere uh, how can you communicate to your customer to the global society that your company becoming more green that you're doing uh, the right steps and actions and then you have some volunteering uh, companies it, they usually uh, volunteering incentives uh, which raise usually from companies uh, company associations and uh, non-government organizations for example 
as a tax and charges, we uh, um, a bright example is carbon tax, subsidies and investments. You also have uh, when the government, uh, gov different governments might uh, subsidize the electricity from renewable energy sources uh, and make the cost parity between the electricity from traditional sources, from the coal, from the oil, and from the wind turbine, for example. Then you have the trading schemes. It also disrupt um, carbon emission things. It's like the carbon market when you trade your um, quotes and volume of carbon emitted toward the atmosphere with different entities. For example, my business can sell. Uh, we okay. We produced 100 megatons of CO2, and uh, we have a right to emit 120 so i can sell 20 to another party then you have the regul in regulator we have operations and product uh, initiatives operations you uh, it means that uh, the government frame the direction of how business should operate how to how it should be decarbonized uh, at what um, stages and other things and in product um, it will be also a lecture a lecture from Ekaterin about the uh, eco design, and uh, she'll probably uh, give you a more holistic outlook into this. In product, you have ICO standards, um, how, how to produce real good uh, uh, things in accordance with circular economy, for example. In information activities, you have three types of initiatives um, certification, it's eco labeling. Uh, as a for example, you come to the store and you would like to understand which, um, let's say, which milk should I buy? This milk um, is with echo labeling, this is without, uh, with not. Which, which, which one should I prefer if, I'm, if I would like to make the world more sustainable? Then you have the data gathering is, um, is usually comes from academical institutions and they describe you how to how to align uh, measurements and other things to unify the data then the disclosure principles this is more for investors and in volunteering um, this is really interesting and holistic uh, thing we will discuss it later okay so now this is the executive summary of the policy that i would like to go through with you uh, we will discuss in details every of them do you have any maybe a preliminary questions on these incentives maybe in some not understandable terminology this is also a very interesting thing that uh, i mentioned the financial incentives and actually they are the most powerful one uh, by two reasons the first we live in a world of capitalism where the the money is like the, the real blood of organization and uh, they are valued a lot. And secondly, um, market-based approaches um, threatens uh, the company uh, profitability. This is why the companies should um, pay attention to it. Uh, since a lot of companies uh, value their revenue, uh, earnings, uh, and other financial statements, they do really care about their losses. So. Completely no companies would like to lose some money from uh, some regulation on financials. And they, um, yeah, they took a, a, a tight con uh, consideration to it. Okay, let's firstly start, uh, we'll start from uh, financial incentives with you. And um, as, a, as a bright and I would say unique example, we would look and into the um, European Green Deal. Uh, have you ever heard about this one? Maybe you did. Did you hear Antonius? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Does anybody hear, hear about this thing? Okay. Um, it was just interesting. So. In brief, this is the first ecosystematic uh, roadmap from European Commission to achieve climate neutral European continent by 2015. And as you can see on the, on the slide, on the picture on the right hand side, 
uh, there are a lot of uh, directions of action that they would like to do. Transition to circular economy, uh, financing tr this transition, sustainable transport, far farm to fork, a lot of activities with different goals. And this summer was a um, pretty unique period when the European Commission published a lot of roadmaps of the, how they would like to implement those farm to fork strategy, for example. What is more is um, why I'm saying this as ecosystematic, because it involves all four types of initiatives that we discussed with you, financial, regulatory, informational, and volunteering. They are all involved inside. Uh, government and private financing uh, via, via European investment plan. This is uh, the trade of this initiative. When the government not only financing it, but it also attract capital from private institutions, from businesses, from credit and banking organizations, and other things. Um, the, so yeah, the, as I said, uh, the main goal is to achieve climate neutral continent by 2015 and take the leading film in this. Um, wh what is more about this program? So. It also lays, uh, so the basis of this program uh, is CO2 regulation, which is built on Paris agreements. We'll discuss it a little bit um, after. Yeah, but the, the key thing also here is that it has ambiguous business impact since, yeah, it support a large scale transformation, that, uh, but this transformation may, may shrink the number of market players while uh, flourishing uh, the biggest and the strongest one. Um, just as an example, imagine, imagine I would like to start up my own um, cement uh, plant because uh, it will be a lot of construction in the country and I'm starting it. And there is an established uh, big, biggest player. So both the player and my plant need to be carbon neutral or something close to this. And at the, at the very beginning of the business, it will cost a lot for me because I don't have really established business processes um, comparing with the, the biggest player. And it will be more difficult for me to flourish in this atmosphere. So it disrupted a, a bit uh, competitive advantage of the companies. Um, I would like to, to briefly uh, describe every of the aspect that is uh, involved in this uh, company. The first one is um, biodiversity. So the plan is that European Union countries, they would like to treat 30% of lands and seas that are in the European Union. So take them under the safe environment to look after them, to remediate maybe then we have farm to fork and this is one of the pillar of this uh, European Green Deal. This is all about sustainable food system. Uh, just a, a brief step, uh, step, a step left uh, with existing trends on, um, on the global world population and with, excuse me. Okay, yeah, so with the current trend and trajectory of global population growth and existing uh, food systems, uh, how we grow it, how to we cultivate the cultures, how we distribute it, we are not going to food to feed really 10 billion of people by 2050. And this is uh, why farm to fork is very crucial here because it's re-engineer all this uh, food system in European Union from a domestic and local production, uh, use, to using fertilizer, to using new uh, agricultural things to reduce the risks of chemicals pollution and uh, pesticides, then organic farming and sustainable food labeling. And what is more, um, they make it uh, like a circle. So they also implement a very interesting part called uh, waste management. So European Union government will uh, uh, look at uh, companies, at restaurants, at uh, supermarkets, of how they uh, ut um, utilize their food waste and uh, how many food waste they are, there are. The next one is sustainable agriculture. This is like the part of farm to fork 
but it involves more um, like practical uh, optimi optimization of existing practices of how can we grow more, how we can pre prevent uh, our crops from degradation and diseases and other things. Another interesting thing is clean energy. And the clean energy, um, it's, the plan is to promote uh, low carbon fuels, uh, including hydrogen for sectors that are hard to decarbonize, like cement indus industry, like um, steel production, and accelerate the use of electricity produced from renewable sources and adapt also energy market uh, and infrastructure to more complex and integrated system. For example, um, this is uh, maybe, maybe Yekaterian told you on previous lectures, but in the United Kingdom, there are uh, a lot of energy uh, facilities that produce energy and that's okay. But at five o'clock, this is the time um, where in the United Kingdom, uh, they used to drink tea. But they boil all the tea, uh, boil uh, all the uh, tea stuff, and it consumes such amount of energy that the United Kingdom have to buy it from the France. And uh, the plan is to make it more uh, easy, like th uh, those uh, patterns more easy, more affordable for everyone, and to produce it also from renewable energy sources. Then we have the sustainable industry one. Uh, is, uh, the plan is to stimulate uh, the development of new markets for climate neutral and circular products. Uh, this means actually to redesign uh, existing products to make them uh, more recyclable, more healthy and not utilize uh, resources so much. Then we have the building plan. Uh, it's all about the, we need to promote renewable energy supply for um, efficient building, circularity in construction materials, uh, and also in implement some digital pro projects. For example, um, we will um, build, your, the ambition is to build maybe some uh, uh, solar panels on top of the roof to partially supply the building with energy or to, to pr produce materials with, uh, with, that will accumulate all the heat in winter and it will be also cool uh, in summer inside the building. But then the very interesting thing here is sustainable mobility. It's all about the electric vehicle, the uh, mobility as a service platforms, uh, about automated mobility and smart traffic management systems. So since European is pretty, uh, uh, it's not so big uh, comparing to Russia because it, it, for me, it's easy to compare it to my country. European is not so big and um, the mobility of uh, population increased uh, last years. For example, I can move from Amsterdam to London for maybe just two hours. This is a pretty short amount of time. And uh, the, the government think, how can we make it more sustainable? Because if you're taking the plane, <clears throat> it emits a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere. So how can we reuse it? And then uh, some initiatives on pollution, on chemicals and other things. Um, yeah, very, uh, seems like we're a giant goal. And uh, this is, if they will not achieve 100% of it, it will be, it, will, it is still a very good push toward the global sustainability. So the question is how they will pay for it. Where will the money come from? And this is the um, very like sim simple, simple um, scheme of how uh, this will be financed. So basically this European Green Deal mobilizing at least 1 trillion euros of sustainable investment over the next decade. A greater share of spending on climate uh, projects and environmental actions come from the European budget, which you can see here, it's uh, half a trillion of euros. Um, yeah, uh, and the key role here in financing also will be played by European Investment Bank. Up to 30% um, of in those investments would come mostly from the private sector. So the idea is that companies would be encouraged to make uh, risky green investments uh, by loan guarantees from the European Investment Bank. Uh, how does it work? For example, imagine I'm, um, let's say, 
Okay, I'm a steel company somewhere in the Europe, uh, and I I probably heard about the European Green Deal, and now I'm building in the new plant, and I need to supply it with energy somehow, and I have an option, for example, to invest one billion dollars to build the coal plant, and uh, invest one billion dollars, what one and okay three billion dollars to build a solar facility with solar panels. Um, probably I don't have those money and I will uh, loan it from the bank, from uh, maybe from government, from some pension funds. I come to them and say, okay, guys, I would like to take a loan from you. And they uh, give you two options according with this green deal. If you build the coal plant, we will give you 1 billion, but it will be for 10 years and uh, you have to pay um, 10% up on it. So the, the rate is 10%. But and the second option, we can give you 3 billion of euros or dollars, but the discount rate will be 2%, which is five times less and uh, for 30 years. And uh, what does it mean? Is that this is more attractive for a company that because they just need to pay um, $600, $600 million dollars instead of big amount of money when they building the coal plant. So it facilitates building more uh, green facilities in European Union. And also we have a uh, European Just Transition Fund that will gather up to 50 billion euros uh, of investments, which is pretty large injection uh, into the economy. Uh, this mechanism also will help uh, to, to promote R&D investments and activities within the European Union. Yeah, so this was the first part, very complex, uh, very complex mechanism, a very interesting one. Uh, then what we have, then we had another interesting uh, financial mechanism, uh, carbon tax and European trading system. Did you guys uh, heard about this one? Maybe about the carbon no. tax? Not really. I'm sorry, what? A carbon tax? Yeah, carbon tax. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. I thought it was carbon free. Oh, yes. Yeah, so carbon tax is pretty hot topic right now because this summer European Union uh, made, bold, made bold statements that they will implement carbon tax in two or three years and it will disrupt a lot of economies. So those two schemes are working in European Union right now. And also in other countries, um, as I remember, China and Canada, they do have uh, something similar to those systems and also Australia. Um, so yeah, how does it work? The first one is trading, uh, trading um, European emission trading system. It, um, how does it work? It limits the greenhouse gases emission by facility. So they say, okay, your plant, plant A, should not emit more than uh, 208, 280 uh, megatons of CO2 uh, yearly. And it allow exchange, trading, and offsetting activities. Uh, which sectors it covers? Power and heat generation, energy intensive industries such as oil and gas production, uh, mineral production, uh, metal production, and other things, and also aviation. Just an as an example, how does it work? Imagine plant A, uh, they produce 300 megatons of CO2 and plant B, uh, 270. So the first plant have an, um, they, they are actually more than allowed a uh, dozen of CO2 and they have to either decrease those amount of CO2 emitted or they can buy um, some unused potential from the plant B. So it means that they can buy uh, 10 mega, uh, metric tons of CO2 from plant B. And um, somehow they need to, to decrease their carbon footprint by 10 uh, megatons. And they can do it by offsetting. Offsetting is basically buying those certificates, investing in other projects in other countries and other things. This is one thing. So. The key takeaway from this system is that it 
limits the amount of uh, emissions by facility from one facility, and then it works. While the carbon tax is a bit uh, difficult, uh, a bit uh, different, it usually set the price for uh, each G G greenhouse gas metric ton per product and per operation activities. This is very direct and transparent and apply for sectors not covered in European ETS. Okay, and but you also can see uh, that if you look at the country profile, you have uh, the pretty big discrepancy in prices. For example, in Poland, you will pay less than <laughs> one euro per one metric ton and in sweden you will pay as much as 110 euros this is insane amount and this means that uh, poland uh, for example poland um, let's say transportation company will not pay anything for this excess of uh, co2 emission while the sweden company will pay a lot for these emissions and this is open question how we can harmonize it but this is how does it work internally and uh, also European Union announced that it will work an <clears throat> externally toward the another countries, another um, yeah, in other countries. For example, trading with Russia, yeah, this is a very hard example. Um, Russia usually sells oil and gas products and metals and other things to, to European. And uh, how does it carbon tax will apply to Russian uh, trading schemes? For example, I uh, have a plant. Uh, that produce metal from coal combustion, from oil and gas, then we use not really clean technologies, and we have the steel with a pretty big and pretty much carbon footprint. And at the same time, we have the plant in European Union with pretty low carbon footprint. Imagine Russia sells its uh, steel tower to European Union, and European on European border, they say, okay, guys, your um, steel is um, pretty intensive in carbon footprint and it means that you have to pay premium because it's not very sustainable it's not very green you have to pay premium and the amount of those premium is high uh, because the company will think okay why should we pay uh, why should we pay for other products and other money so we will actually lose our profit just because we would like to sell it to europe and uh, so this is two options for the company, just pay those money or to use this money to decarbonize its production. But it's not pretty fa uh, fair because um, it's, it's pretty short in just two or three years and it will disrupt a lot of economies. I also read the research on different estimations. Um, Russia will lose up to 15% of its uh, money from trading into um, with different countries with European Union only by carbon tax, which is an insane amount of uh, money. Uh, and here, guys, I would like to make a brief um, a brief break um, and to think with you. What do you think? What are the pro um, advantages and disadvantages of each of the system? Uh, what are the open questions that need to be addressed? Let's spend, I would say, uh, up to seven minutes on this breakout, and then we'll move forward. You can annotate, uh, uh, annotate on the screen or write down in comments in chat, or just you can unmute yourself and uh, say something, discuss. Yes, in the pros, it's an initiating step uh, for the world to follow the, the sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. This is nice, nice catch. Yeah. This is true, Hazim. Thank you. Thank you. Any other ideas? What might be the disadvantages of those systems? Uh, I think uh, it, the cons is, I think it's hinder the uh, economic growth of several countries, especially the uh, small countries. And exactly. uh, I think in order to uh, keep the low emissions and 
uh, use sustainable energy, you need to uh, grow your economy, uh, your economy mm -hmm. at the same time. I think uh, you exactly. need both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. This is very nice catch. Uh, thank you for it. This is a a, a big disadvantage because uh, the countries with not major economies, um, like not European countries, not American countries, they have to. They don't have established uh, manufacturing, but they also have to pay premium for to in other countries because they are just selling their goods. It's a very big um, disadvantage of it because it's increasing the quality in the business sector and in the world. Okay, any other ideas? In the last lecture, Professor told us that uh, it is somehow more skewed in giving uh, opportunities to electric companies such as Tesla and stuff. So, mm -hmm. so maybe that that is uh, the bias bias behind this uh, carbon taxing. Yeah, it might be true because, because yeah, they, <clears throat> it will not apply to Tesla, for example, but Tesla, um, actually, they have the carbon footprint. Yeah, nice catch, Hazim, thank you. I would also highlight that open question is uh, how to set up the amount of carbon tax. Um, yeah, the, the price of carbon tax, because as you can see previously, the price is uh, extremely uh, in, in discrepancy. And uh, one more thing also, like the, the takeaway from this thing, if you will look at ETS, your European trading system uh, scheme, it fixes uh, the amount of CO2 emitted by one facility, while the carbon tax don't do this um, because in carbon tax if you have money you can say okay i have money i will just produce as i produced previously but we'll just pay some premium on this is especially if you are located somewhere in poland you say okay this is not the very big amount of money i will do this and uh, it does not re actually decrease amount of carbon in the atmosphere Okay, guys, uh, I think that uh, we can move forward. And before moving forward, uh, before the uh, describing uh, regulatory incentives and three others, uh, I would suggest you to make, a, let's say, um, seven minute break. And uh, I'll be waiting you in seven, 10 minutes, okay? It's ni ni nice time to drink uh, a bit of water to finish your meal or to start it. Okay, let's meet in seven minutes. Okay. Also, you can uh, ask some questions in the chat if you have it for, uh, so far.
that it should actually be. This is true, I absolutely agree with you because <clears throat> uh, this is a lot of doubts about the uh, methodology of how to me measure the actual cost of this carbon tax. But also you write that the tax also can encourage firms to look for alternatives like solar power plant, but then the previous meeting the professor mentioned about the mining of the raw materials for the solar power plant can actually have a negative impact on soil biodiversity. Yes, that, that is also true. Uh, this is why uh, <clears throat> we need to rush toward the sustainability alternatives, such as uh, wind turbines or um, wind turbines or solar plants, because it also extracts something from the earth and we need to be conscious about it. 
<coughs> okay, and uh, I would like to continue with you <coughs> and to talk in in more details about the other incentives. Now we're coming to regulatory <coughs> incentives, and um, this actually on the global arena there are three big uh, players. I'm I, I'm speaking about the global players, not the governments, because every government have its own own plans. But I'm talking about more like bigger systems. The first one is United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is the branch of United Nations, and it supports and possesses the broad impact globally. They um, help countries to implement their uh, sustainability plans or decarbonization activities. We also have uh, World Bank Group. This is, uh, they are primarily deploys financial incentives with partial engagement and investments. So let's say they invest some uh, green facility building like solar plants, or they subsidize some electricity in uh, difficult regions of the world. And then we have International Monetary Fund. They uh, do more consultancy. They consult countries on fiscal policies, on any policies implementation and reporting and data and disclosure in initiatives. They, this is like the big consulting company. Uh, across the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNF, CCC. There are a lot of um, bodies, a lot of cabinets. Um, their structure are on the side. Yeah. Uh, any question? Okay. Yeah. Let's go. So the, uh, they have pretty big structure. Um, the convention is a part of United Nations, and it was created in 1994. The ultimate object of the convention is to stabilize greenhouse gas concentration at the level that would uh, prevent dangerous anthropogenic or human-induced um, inference, inter interference with the climate system. It states that uh, this level should be achieved within this time frame, sufficient to allow ecosystem to adapt naturally to climate change and to ensure uh, that food production is not uh, threatened. And to enable economic uh, development to proceed in a sustainable manner. This is like the citation from their um, agenda. Uh, despite the broad and the, uh, intersective bodies, organs, and committees, there are all four types of initiatives employed actually, <clears throat> but uh, the biggest focus is on um, organ. Um, the, big, the biggest focus is the policy uh, is on uh, regulation policies. Um, the most interesting initiatives are listed on the slide, and the work, the scope of work done is huge. Actually, uh, by the moment, they have a subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice that um, consults uh, on scientific and technological matters related to carbon emissions. They do have a subsidiary body for implementation that help uh, companies and uh, assess the perspectiveness of implementation of some projects and other things. Um, at, at the same time, so this is the, the biggest initiative that we have in the world. Um, as, a, as a next step of it, <clears throat> we have the, as, as a first step, I would say, uh, that they uh, created, it was the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, so the Kyoto Protocol was the first trial attempt to limit global warming and the greenhouse gases emission. Um, it was created in 1997. Um, it accounts for different uh, greenhouse gases and uh, consult on how to reduce them. Uh, but um, the key takeaways from this, we have the mechanism yeah, uh, involved in this. We have the international emission trading, joint implementation and clean development mechanism. Uh, what does it mean, international emission trading? Uh, it was a, like a transaction log, um, something like European trading system, but globally, that the countries, entities can sell and buy their quotes on CO2 emissions. Uh, and the, as a result, uh, they tested this system. They found uh, hidden rods and channels that can lead to carbon leakages from one country to another and other things. 
They have also joint implementation mechanism. Uh, it helps to develop carbon reduction projects in developed countries. <coughs> so in existing countries, I'm sorry. Yeah, and uh, how it helped, it developed a large scale projects in, inside the countries, such as power plants, or maybe some new flare station. Uh, but at the same time, they found out some dummy projects, um, like how countries can cheat on each other and other things. And uh, they also have clean development, uh, clean development mechanism. Uh, it allows uh, a country, firm or individual, to implement a project that reduce or remove emission in uh, developing countries and earn um, these emissions credits. So you can actually buy some carbon credits from another country. Uh, and that means that you invest, uh, for example, in some projects in Africa or in uh, Asia and other things. And it it helps uh, the, how it contribute to the world. Uh, it, it promotes technology transfer and knowledge sharing across the countries. At the same time, it uh, lead to carbon leakage uh, because what is carbon leakage is when your firm does not reduce your carbon foot footprint, but it buys carbon credits from another countries for, uh, and investing in, in other projects. Yeah, so a great effort. We learn a lot of um, lessons from it. As a result, um, unfortunately, less than 20% of ratified countries meet their goals. Uh, and unfortunately, at the same time, or as a good lesson for us, the large part of greenhouse gases emission reduction uh, were done via carbon credits. This is when, like I told you previously, when you buy credits from another project or another country. So you are not actually reduce your carbon footprint. Um, then what, come, what came next? Uh, then we had Paris Agreement. Uh, Paris Agreement, um, this is pretty interesting thing for us. This is what every, probably a lot of people heard of. Um, they, the goal is to limit global warming uh, to below 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees. Um, this, they have inside mandatory short-term reports and long-term strat strategies to climate, um, to greenhouse gases mitigation and decrease. And also Paris Agreements provides a framework for tech, financial, technical, and capacity building. So it provides you guidelines on how to implement something, how to decrease your carbon footprint as a country, as an industry, and other things. Uh, and they also are designing uh, enhanced transparency framework. This is like the pro, uh, platform globally with access um, from every country that you can check, is it going good or is it going bad? And this is... Um, as a self-explanatory, you can see the data uh, for uh, how, how, how does it work right now. Uh, you can see that a lot of countries does not do anything. So we have only one green area with <laughs> some, some, uh, just one country doing any effort toward the sustainability. Uh, what about the Russia? You have a big gray chunk here, and this is critically insufficient. <clears throat> now it's um, it's going somewhere to more insufficient uh, because Russia. This data were gathered before uh, Russia announced its carbon uh, carbon greenhouse gases uh, mitigation plan. Now we have it, but it's still insufficient. Uh, okay. What, what, what is more about Paris Agreement? Uh, they unlock 100 billion uh, of climate financing, 30% of which uh, are expected from the private sector. More specifically, um, a brief highlights of, um, of Paris Agreements, how they contribute toward the, toward the, toward the world. Um, so climate action can produce up to 26 trillion uh, dollars globally in economic benefits <clears throat> sorry which is pretty big uh, which is pretty big how they uh, will produce it by building new facilities uh, new businesses like hydrogen businesses maybe <clears throat> maybe solar plants and other things it also has the, the big impact 
into the labor force uh, because the Peru, according to plans, uh, Paris Agreement will create up to 24 million uh, of new jobs and 24 million of uh, new employment uh, places. This sounds like a pretty good alternative. Well, some of the uh, some of the jobs will shrink due to maybe some facilities closure. Okay, you close coal plant and you uh, some people lose their job but uh, they also working on how to re-educate those people how to re-educate them and to allocate them into modern industries such as like um, solar technologies <clears throat> at the same time climate related disasters cost nearly 2.3 trillion dollars over the past two decades uh, if you're comparing the numbers the benefits from Paris Agreement implementation uh, overweight the uh, threats and uh, and costs from the climate uh, disasters. Uh, and about the Paris Agreement, there is also a very interesting thing from the investor side. <clears throat> uh, ahead of the the situation ahead of the 2019 uh, United Nations Climate Action Summit, a group of approximately 500 investors clearly and boldly announced uh, that um, the, they urged leaders to act uh, the climate crisis with the utmost urgency. So they pushed them and say, okay, guys, you need to act boldly and right now. At the same time, those investors, it was not just the people who are just gathering together, say, oh, governments, you have to do anything. No, um, those investors own approximately managing assets of 35 trillion it's nearly half of the world invested capital so imagine all the money invested in the world half of those money uh is owned by 500 people and those 500 people say okay guys you need bold and clear actions toward toward the sustainability so please uh address it via the uh, paris agreements uh so overall what do we have about the paris agreements uh it's, it's in, it sounds like just a first impulse toward the global, global sustainability. And a lot of countries agree on that. So they say, okay, yeah, we, we uh, indeed re need to act boldly to reduce our greenhouse gases emissions. But uh, this is like the final point. The ne as a next step, nobody really understands what should they do. Um, there are no uh, laws and regulations on which country should reduce which amount of carbon footprint from itself and it it gives a uh, on it also goes to the responsibility of the country and for example uh i i analyzed uh the very interesting example of uh transport sector in russia and germany um they both uh, both of the countries produced their climate agenda according to the Paris Agreements. Um, in transportation sector, uh, the ambition of Russia is seven times less than Germany. So when, for example, Germany it tells, we would like to, uh, to reduce carbon footprint from our transportation sector by X, X, uh, X times, Russia is saying that it's seven times less. So it's, it's completely nothing. Uh, and it means that it might be everywhere in the world. So one country just might say, okay, uh, it's, it will be very costly for us. It will be very difficult. So we will write down just something uh, and it will work. So this is another disadvantage of Paris Agreement that they not aligned and urge countries to uh, harmonize each, each other somehow. So they don't have any numerical liabilities toward each other on reduction of carbon footprint. Uh, what else uh, about the Paris Agreement? Yeah, at the same time, they involve a lot of people, a lot of uh, society attraction, and uh, this is pretty still hot topic right now. Uh, okay, we talked with you about the regulate, uh, regulatory incentives, then we're coming to informational one. And talking about the informational is uh, <clears throat> basically reporting activities. Uh, reporting standards are inconsistent right now and may vary by country, institution, and industry. 
what is the reporting standards? What does it mean? Uh, basically, a reporting standard is the major is the major feedback loop, providing the real information uh, from from the company, from the country, from the city, what they are doing, uh, what is their performance, and they provide those information for to the private sector, to the public sector. Uh, and the key interest here lay within the investors because as an investor, I would like to understand in which company should I invest my money, whether it's sustainable company, not sustainable. Um, as an investor, I would not uh, invest in, let's say, coal plant because in the long-term perspective, it will not give me any money or it will, in the worst case, uh, take my money from me. Yeah. Uh, so this is why reporting standard is uh, really crucial and they uh, vary by obligatory degree. So are they uh, voluntary, like from the initiative from NGO or they are mandatory from the governmental source? They vary by uh, guidance depth level. So some reporting standards just tell you directionally that, okay, just guys, tell, uh, tell to the investors about this, this, and this. And another another um, depth level is when you have strict standards and guidelines. Okay, so for example, uh, in mining industry, you need to communicate about your water use, about your electricity use, about uh, soil degradation. You have to provide uh, concentration of different minerals in in the soil. This is very like deep level of uh, deep level of guidance. And also they vary by source of issuance or authority who emit those um, principles. Um, however, yeah, the current uh, reporting system are inconsistent at the moment, and I will uh, describe it a bit uh, later. Uh, now, so key question, why do investors seek for high ESG rating because the companies, uh, why I'm telling this this is more uh, primarily for investors, those reporting standards, because you can see uh, it was a Harvard, uh, re Harvard Business School research that um, highlight that the company, uh, high sustainability companies outperform their uh, uh, counterparts over the long term, both in terms of stock market as well as accounting performance. And this is actually the, the big discrepancy between, between uh, those uh, two companies. So it means that now investors look into the ESG uh, rating of companies. And um, okay, we understand that investors look for uh, sustainable or uh, companies with high ESG rating. Then open question, how can uh, they track those performance of company? Uh, there are actually uh, a lot of uh, reporting uh, things, a lot of uh, reporting systems, uh, agencies, platforms, organizations, solutions that are providing standards, uh, developing and recommending frame framework and guidelines. Some of them are more responsible than others. Some are industry specific. For example, Sustainable Analytics, they are, is just the rating system for every company on uh, based on some dimensions uh, we have also cdp uh, uh, carbon disclosure principles uh, as i remember and sasb this is like the guidelines on how companies should uh, communicate their sustainability uh, what are the disclosure principles in the mining industry it's for example that you have to tell about your water use sources of water uh, volume of water used and other things but the most interesting thing here is that we have uh, that is the the big and crucial problem for investors and then it it was a research from MIT school school of management and uh, among the two biggest ESG rating providers MSCI and Sustainalytics for example correlation coefficient is 0 0.5 which means uh, that if Sustainalytics tell that this company is really sustainable, MSCI might tell that this company is not sustainable at all. So who, uh, who, uh, who is wrong? Uh, what should I uh, trust to? This is open question. This means a significant inconsistency of raw data consumed and assessment approaches. And this is a real big problem right now um, because um, 
an, another example, P, uh, PwC company survey uh, reveals that nearly three quarter of investors are um, neutral or somewhat dissatisfied with current environmental, social and governments reporting practices. So at the same time, from one point of view, they don't have enough data to analyze which company is sustainable. At the same uh, time, they don't really have um, valid informational sources of it. And this is the big question because investors uh, don't want to lose their money and they are, don't have any information on sustainability about, of company and they just will not invest those money into more sustainable initiatives. And it prevents the capital to go into the sustainable sustainability sphere. Uh, and the, the last one is initiative that I would like to discuss with you is uh, industry specific one. Uh, I called them previously as a voluntary one, uh, and I'm describing why. So they uh, they usually goes from the in either industry or um, from the topic. Industry specific arise uh, as a common voice of manufacturers and uh, commitments to drive changes. For example, um, yeah. Industry specific is International Council of Chemical Association, as an example. And topic specific are uh, to advocate the topic development and to scale them up. For example, Hydrogen Council. Uh, the key difference, uh, industry specific uh, is come up from, um, for example, a lot of uh, chemical plants, chemical production, uh, like BASF, uh, uh, though DuPont and other things, they come together and say, okay, we, need, we would like to create something bigger, something industrial, and to make our uh, industry more green or something like that. So they set sustainability standards specific to its industry and provide the guidelines for their achievement. So how they can achieve it. And uh, it may serve a strong reference point for some investors. If the weather company um, Include, is included in those association or not. Uh, for example, my company does not belong to this uh, association. And as an investor, I would say, okay, this is very interesting why he is not advocating for sustainability. Open question. Another one, uh, another approach is topic specific and topic specific is related to, uh, to some technology, to some principle maybe, as a technology is hydrogen council. Uh, hydrogen Council is a CEO-led initiative for hydrogen technologies deployment and energy transition. It sets common vision and rational for transition, deploy pilot projects and guidelines. At the same time, it includes a lot of companies from metallurgy, from uh, uh, mobility, from oil and gas. So a lot of different companies, but they are all interested in hydrogen deployment. So voluntary initiatives represent the company goodwill toward the changes and intend to be sustainable and responsible for its future. Uh, and it also, it's very crucial point that it might positively reflect on company reputation. Also investors might look at uh, the company from the prism of its allocation and belonging to any society, any group, uh, interest group and other things. <clears throat> Uh, and this is the end of the second uh, big block about the initiatives. Uh, we have an executive summary of those initiatives with a lot of text. Uh, I will share it uh, with you after the lecture. Do you guys have any questions before we start the new one? No questions. No questions. Okay. Okay. So the next one is uh, more like. I uh, encourage you to include this, this uh, to engage to this open discussion about the next step and opportunities. Um, so what is next? What should we do with this all information? Um, and I would like to encourage you to think in terms of future CEO of a company or chief sustainability officer. Uh, what can you do? What are the opportunities for your company? This is like my thoughts on it. Um, what what can be done? Basically, there are four firstly barriers that we 
uh, understood. The first one is misalignment between government business institutions uh, because they don't have the real um, coherent direction of uh, the direction of development. Second one is a lack of consistency in problems understanding and uh, goals to achieve because some countries might uh, have giant goals, another one don't have any goals at all. Um, and there is no uh, unit of actions, as I said. The third one is that few amount of cross-disciplinary thinkers and leaders, binders. We don't really have, a lot, uh, on the global arena, there are uh, a strong need for people from the, from the variety of backgrounds. Uh, not just the very deep and narrow specialist, but like the, the people with um, polynomial uh, way of thinking, that they knew economy, they knew business, um, they knew and understand some science, and they would like to contribute something big to society. And we need those people. We need uh, the people who will advocate for those changes, who will uh, encourage others to study something more, to do more, to take more actions. And the first biggest, uh, the biggest question, who will pay the premium for being green? And uh, those barriers uh, reveal uh, in front of us potential areas of moving. Uh, the first one is <clears throat> about understanding sustainability, understanding what does it mean. So sustainability is not being green just because it's good. It's not a very good topic thing. Uh, like, okay, guys, let's be let's be green. Don't be brown or don't don't be bad. Uh, we firstly we need to uh, we need the concise taxonomy and goals understanding and strong rationale for changes because business will not transform just because it's good. Uh, they need clear, clear rational economical one, uh, long term, short term. Why they need those changes because they will not invest money just for, just for fun but another option is another opportunity is that lack of transparency stops uh, proactive actions and produce concerns uh, it prevents us from actions those misalignments misunderstandings of different actions uh, and disclosure of goals and actions uh, as you remember keys from investor reporting it stops uh, people from going to to toward the sustainability. And the third uh, opportunity window is that sustainability transformation is not a pro bono. So who should pay for it? Um, we need more clear, all, all clear allocation of roles, responsibilities in line with capacity for changes. So the question is who, who should pay for for this sustainability transformation? Should I pay as a civil uh, citizen of my country? Should uh, the government pay for it? Should the business pay for it? Um, we need to really allocate these roles and responsibilities clearly and boldly. And we also need a better capital allocation and asset management to prevent investors from investing in uh, real traditional energy sources, or carbon negative projects, car uh, yeah, carbon negative projects. And we need also to e <clears throat> in more invest in research and development activities. So what are the opportunities for every stakes that I would like to um, synthesize from this lecture? Uh, on my opinion, from on bus for business, uh, there are four opportunities. Sea level should understand the need of changes. Uh, they need to develop green technologies to foster them. The unity, uh, they have to be unified under the association, uh, like in an example with Hydrogen Council. And they need to come to government uh, and to take into the dialogue with them to, to, to develop our world. Uh, another thing uh, for government opportunity is that they need to grow their own policymakers with relevant background to facilitate fruitful cooperation. They need to, to have a dialogue for to incentivize optimization and they need transparency of action and suggestion to collaborate. Because if the government will not allocate capital clearly, I would not probably give, you, give them money to make something more green. Because I don't know where my money comes, comes from and goes for. And for institution, uh, for private equity, for venture capital firms, 
This is the firms who man, uh, manage the assets, manage the cash, uh, and uh, invest it. Um, they need to communicate who pays answer and allocate capital respectively. Um, this is uh, like the um, aftermath of the lecture. This is my thoughts. Uh, do you guys have any questions before we starting uh, next chapter? Okay, so now um, I, I would suggest you to play the game. Uh, this is the description of a game. Imagine that uh, you have a large company. Uh, you're a CEO of the company. Uh, and this morning, your team of executives received the letter from officials and company CEO uh, with obligation to create and implement the carbonization plan. So I suggest you guys um, to think about uh, incentives that you can do in every uh, of this aspect, in financial, in regulatory, in informational, in volunteering part. <clears throat> this is also the card of your company, uh, that you're a petroleum company in Middle East. Imagine you are extract oil uh, from the sand, from the land, then you produce it into the fossil fuels or for the, uh, just the fuels for cars, for uh, aviation and cell. Uh, a large amount of extractive infrastructure and plants, you have it. So imagine this is your plant, the pretty big amount of uh, turbines in, in, the in the sense. It depends largely on the fossil fuels price on the global market. So you would don't want really to disrupt it. Um, yeah, and uh, also the global warming threatens you with terrorism risk in the region. So as a uh, management board of the company, you need to think in, in every aspect, what can your company do? And uh, for this game, I would, ask, uh, I would ask organizers to share these uh, cards with you. There is a tip and thoughts. It will be appeared somehow in WhatsApp. Uh, I will also uh, divide you by breakdowns. Let's check how many of us are there. Mm -hmm. Do, do you guys any, uh, have any questions on the game? We have, we'll have approximately, let's say, uh, 10 minutes and then five minutes for presentation. Uh, I will, moving from room to room to, um, to help you with the task. Do you have any questions right now? So we, sorry, uh, just uh -huh. to clarify. So we, we basically get like, some sort of cards and we have to like answer these four questions right uh not really so um yeah uh directionally yes you have uh this is like uh let me annotate um you have this description of your company here this is what your company company looks like but then you have to understand okay we need to uh imagine to create the plan for our company decarbonization what are the financial incentives, regulatory, informational, and volunteering incentives that can be implied to our company? So imagine uh, in financial, we can, um, as a government, you can imply uh, some financial incentives like carbon tax to your company, and then you have to will have to pay for it. Maybe in informational, you would like to be interested in. Uh, gaining more money from investors, so you will report your sustainability actions. So I would encourage you to think ab about these things. Okay. All right. So we 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 do we answer this as the company owner, right? Not as the not as the government or anything, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm I'm opening the breakout rooms right now. It will be three of uh, breakout rooms. Or let's even make two of them. Okay. I will assign it manually.
and for another one. Okay, I'm opening the rooms, guys. Uh, I encourage you to be proactive uh, and you have 10 minutes to discuss. Uh, if you will have questions, just write them down on chat and I will be uh, shuffling around the room. Hello, guys. Hello, guys. Hello, guys. So, what are we going to talk about? So, we are assuming that we are a company in the Middle East that we need to change into a greener company, I think. Fernando. company we picked for ourselves or is it already mentioned in the no from the from the roman oh, slide yeah, yeah. petroleum company right okay yeah. mm. so uh, what do you think sandra in do you guys have any idea about this? How oil companies can be cleaner? Uh, I feel it. I found it difficult. Oh, no, sing, I do sing, apa, screenshot soal enggak? Ada, ada, ada. Sebentar. Kirim lah, Gus. Si, si. Tak kirim lewat. Apa ya? Saya ingin WA itu, Pak. Line, Pak. Oh, WA ada ya? WA, WA. Oh, di WA ada. Ada. Okay. Ini berarti kita yang petroleum company itu. Iya. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, let's let's discuss the first question. What costs will you face due to carbon tax and how and cap and trade system? What costs will you face due to carbon tax and cap and trade system? Yeah, you are. I think it will disrupt our company finance, right? Yeah. It probably reduce our uh, capital or cost. Who will finance your decarbonization and how you will approach this? Uh, first of all, we will ask for some subsidies by the government because as it is said that it, it happened immediately, right? We were not given any time or something. You are a large company operating in the world uh, due to climate change. This morning, your team of executives received the letter from officials and companies with the obligation to create and implement a decarbonization plan. Okay. What pathway would you align to? How would you try to set your own goals? How will you facilitate the dialogues with the government? What is it long-term goals or just yes, short-term one? Yes, we can we can divide it into two. That will be short-term goals and long-term goals. Well, I think for the long term, uh, we should probably change the uh, the company face into a more sustainable energy because uh, we're I think we're Hi guys. Um, hello, sir. Hello. How is it going? Yeah, yeah, till now we are thinking that we should divide uh, our goals into short term and long term periods. Yeah, nice catch. Nice catch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In oh, long yeah, term, 
Oh yeah, your first probably lesson. Probably we will just uh, want to completely change the business model. Maybe go towards more sustainable production and uh, may even change the what we are actually doing our business in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but currently, in short terms, uh, we have to think how to how we can uh, pay this carbon tax. Probably, we can approach the government and ask for subsidies. Mm-hmm. This happened. Yeah, to- yeah. This is a very nice uh, attempt. Yeah. If you would like to uh, more assistance, guys, you can just ask answer those questions uh, that we are on the in they they are in WhatsApp group on the slide, like in informational what information what information do you think uh, is the crucial for the investors what information will you disclose you can just open uh, this it will it will might uh, it might help you what information do you think is crucial for investor guys Definitely now because of the carbon tax, we have to include that in our. Uh, we have to include that in our profit and loss account, right? In our balance sheet, we have to show that okay, we are paying this much as a carbon tax. That is an important information that we have to disclose, right? Yep. And how will? Agenda. Every company needs a filter for um, the filter. What about that? I ever heard about the uh, oil mining company that they actually wasted their uh, when when the mining activity oh, goes. There are a lot of power waste in the torch burning torch. I don't know what what it what it used for, but actually the the fire from burning torch can be uh, reallocate re- reallocate to be uh, another energy source. Yeah, maybe. That's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, maybe. yeah. I I I have heard that there are some yeah factory that use the. No, when the... when when the mining activity goes. They they usually burning something mm-hmm. to to suck the oil and gas from the uh, from the earth. That that burning activity actually can be another sources of energy. Have you seen that? No. What? <laughs> Yeah. What's the name? What is the name? Istilah. Uh, Istilah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Uh, what do you call it? Wait, wait. Oil company touch. Yes, like over. You you see this when mining activity goes. Ah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, that actually can can be something attractive to the investor. So, so yeah. in our company, yes. actually, we don't waste any energy. But but so even I, I the waste what, can become energy. Yeah, we saying. we we using the waste to become energy. But bagus, you mean the can. bagus, you mean the chimney, right? The chimney yeah, the, yeah, yeah, like like chimney, yeah. but usually in the mining oil mining company, the chimney is doesn't bukan asap yeah. tapi api. Jadi apinya tuh gunanya oh, narik no. narik oh, minyaknya itu. Oh. Oh. Nah itu tuh selama setahun tuh mereka kebakar terus dan nggak dipergunakan. Padahal itu bisa jadi energi. Oh jadi gas gas yang dibuang itu, itu asli bisa dipakai lagi. Iya. Kayak bakar. Oh. Nah, uh. Kayak mana sih? You know? Iya. Gas fire power plant. Gas.
And what about how will you cooperate with other players? Definitely, uh, it will be a good time to cooperate with other sectors such as solar, of course, because uh, China is very good in solar panels and everything. So we need to kind of create these relationship with them and set up our solar farms, you know, and then uh, bring them here in the Middle East, which will help us to for the extraction process, right? Okay. What else do we have? Financial. What costs will you face due to carbon tax and cap? Okay. Uh, okay. What pathways would you align to and how will you set your own goals? Yeah, how will you facilitate the dialogues with the government? Mm -hmm. Also, first of all, in the uh, in the regulatory, the second point, how will you facilitate the dialogues with the government is like, we don't really need to, you know, uh, we have to understand that the whole country is actually based on the petroleum economy, right? We are not as a single company alone in this process. So definitely government uh, has to facilitate us with something, right? And this is the problem for the whole country, not for only one company. And definitely government has to help us uh, provide us with some subsidies in the short term while we are thinking of how to reduce the carbon taxes in the long-term process, right? Yep. Other guys, do you have do you wanna add something? What do you think about the uh, informational? I think we can align with uh, disclosure principles. For the informational, uh, how we how what information do you think is crucial for investor? I think uh, we can charm them by uh, uh, this, yeah, which is transparency for the investor. I think it will be good. Yeah. Okay, okay that's good. So I hope that you had a real productive discussion. Uh, Hazim, uh, who will uh, broadcast from your group? You can choose the speaker. Uh, I can, I can say. Okay, uh, let's just wait for 30 seconds for other participants to join us. They, they probably have a pretty intense discussion since they are not joining us. <laughs> okay, they're joining. Okay, so it seems like uh, everybody uh, came back. I hope you had a real productive discussion and let's share your thoughts with us. Um, so, from the, sec uh, from the second uh, com uh, company, Hazim will start, and then uh, we'll look for, we'll hear the, from the first group. Okay. So first of all, we decided that we should divide our plan into short-term and long-term goals, because okay. this information, as we can see, suddenly came to us by our CEO, and now we are thinking that how we should tackle this situation. So in the short term goals, goals we are thinking of uh, 
approaching the government and asking for some kind of uh, initiatives and help they can provide us with this because first of all middle east is the whole uh, the, the whole country is a petroleum okay. based economy right so yeah. so we are not uh, really alone in this so definitely there's some hope that uh, government will help us with some subsidies and also mm-hmm. uh, yeah that would be our uh, very very short term uh, plan and in the long term we are thinking uh, of using uh, sustainable methods for extraction of the petroleum process because okay. petroleum is definitely our uh, main business but what we can do is uh, to reduce uh, some carbon footprint and that will help us to reduce the carbon tax mm-hmm. we can use solar energy solar farms uh, as yeah, you know is uh, is really rich with uh, solar energy so mm-hmm. we can use that uh, energy in the extraction process of the petroleum and definitely we will also refine our uh, machinery and stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. also high grade petroleum uh, with low carbon footprint that will be okay. our long term goals probably michael will also add some points aditya right where is michael aditya uh, yes yeah yeah i think for the informational i think we will go for the uh, transparency to our investor mm-hmm. like uh, has him said on the dialog i think for volunteering we can cooperate with uh, some sort of company like in china like they are very good with solar power so i think we can use a couple of their machinery and also as as him has said before that uh, in the middle east uh, petroleum is the main uh, main mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is main business is so yeah I think uh we need to be very efficient with our extraction of petroleum so that thus we can uh reduce our cost and be more efficient with our carbon mm-hmm. footprints. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I I like your initiatives they are pretty big scale and I I really appreciate that you divide them to short term and long term. This is a very good business approach. Uh Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's go to the another group uh, who can say what what do you think? Or we will present Antonias so, probably you. Should I or do you want to You you can yeah. do both. You you go first and maybe I will add some addition. Okay. So uh basically what we're uh planning is to actually not thinking of a way out we don't we don't actually thought of a way out but instead we used to uh, we made a plan to recycle so mm-hmm. as you can see in the picture there the the picture in your slide there's a small fire from the chimney right okay okay uh, no, see there's, uh, really many yeah, there's fire <laughs> so bakus knew that that's actually called a gas flare and it's basically fire right that just okay. fire is you know causing carbon dioxide like you said so mm-hmm. instead of just wasting this energy we were thinking of you know re- reusing this fire maybe rerouting it from the chimney to use it for some sort of other i don't know other maybe even other like uh mm-hmm. other players like you said other companies or even reusing it for our own benefit So although we haven't mm-hmm. yet thought of how to reduce the carbon dioxide but we can actually uh, make much more use of it. Yeah. We could make a self sufficient energy for our company that I think it will be great for our company to attract our investor instead of uh-huh. wasting the the energy of the flare we we can maybe use it as our self power plan to create energy for our so we say yeah mm-hmm. yeah, yeah that's very interesting attempt okay anything else but you know of course we will need more uh, cost right 
because mm-hmm. you know, we have to reroute everything and we have to like make the power plan for it, make hire the uh, experts, architects, yeah. since uh, yeah. So yeah, I think for the investor, I think we should just be blatant, right? And we, sh- we should just be blatant and told them what we need, mm-hmm. what we are doing, what's our expectation. It's not a hundred percent. It will it will not be you know a hundred percent chance rate of success, but we're we're trying because it's a uh, regulatory. Yeah. yeah, that's very nice. Thank you so much for your incentives. We heard some really good thoughts and approaches. Uh, I think this is the final of our lecture. I hope you enjoyed it so much. If you will have any questions, you can reach me out in WhatsApp or just ask a question uh, in the group. Uh, all the materials will be sent. And uh, I hope, uh, I wish you a good uh, rest of the day and uh, we'll have other lectures. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roman. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Have a nice day, too. Bye, everyone. Thank you.